down in this, uh, these two chapters, and you might think, well, that's just way too much to take in at one time. Well, there's a lot of things there that I'm not even going to necessarily uh, uh, try to tackle, but uh, I want to primarily focus on chapter 10, verse 7. It says, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. And so the mystery of God finished is the title of the message. The mystery of God finished. One day, all the mysteries, you know, will be finally concluded. And all the things that we don't completely understand, you know, they will be passed. And so, uh, there's certainly a lot of mysteries even in this, and, and I was uh, talking about a little bit about this this morning, actually for our word study in Sunday school, we, we did, talked about mystery, the word mystery in the Bible, and there's a lot of different things that the Bible calls a mystery, and, uh, and there's certainly, uh, you know, even Revelation, you think about the book of Revelation, well, obviously there's some things in Daniel that were still kind of a mystery, things that were shut up, they were concealed. That's what the word means, to be shut up, concealed. And, uh, and, and it, was, it remained a mystery. So then the book of Revelation comes around, and you think, okay, good. Those mysteries are going to be revealed. But then even after they're revealed, there's still a lot of mysteries that <laughs> you just still don't completely get. And, and uh, I feel like, I mean, I like listening to people, lots of different ideas, and it's real easy for me to be like, well, I'm not so sure about that. I don't know if I believe that. Well, it's like offer something else then. <laughs> you know, but my approach is usually like I'll just let them guess and I'll just you know stick with the basics. Okay, so the uh, we're gonna look at all the events that are going on in these two chapters, and if you remember where we left off, it's been a few weeks, and so uh, uh, you know we might do a little bit of uh, touching up, re-explaining a few things. But where we kind of left off, we talked about the different uh, tr judgments, the trumpet judgments. And the first three, uh, or the first four, you know, had a lot to do with fire and there's the destructive nature. But then he says there's going to be three woes. Whoa, 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 the angel says. And it talks about these different woes. And, uh, and then you, you remember uh, we read about um, the, uh, the fifth angel that came. And there is this locust, these locust scorpion type creatures with the face of a man and hair like woman and uh, and they this a weird weird creatures but they come out and they torment people for five months people wishing that they could die but they can't as they're tormented tormented by these locusts and that says okay that was the one woe and then there's two more woes left okay in fact let's look at that back up to chapter eight real quickly eight verse thirteen. <clears throat> And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. Okay, so we know it's talking about the fourth angel, I mean, the, sorry, the fifth angel, sixth angel, seventh angel have to do with these woes. All right, so then we know that that locust was the fifth, uh, the fifth angel, those locust creatures was one of the woes and then chapter 9 verse 12 look at that it says one woe is past and behold there come two more woes hereafter so then verse 13 you see uh and the sixth angel sounded and then that's when you begin to read about the uh this army that comes up of 200 million uh horse i mean they're riding horses but no 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 not just ordinary horses these horses have faces like lions and tails like serpents, and they shoot fire out of their mouth. I mean, you're thinking, like, this is sci-fi, right? <laughs> this is a, Revelation's a cool book, man. <laughs> and a lot of uh, sci-fi and, uh, and different fantasy-type things, you know, they got their creative juices from reading the book of Revelation, I think, because uh, this is some pretty amazing stuff. But it's not sci-fi. This is real. This is stuff that's going to happen. And, of course, after all this happens, and then chapter 9, verse 20, we see that a, uh, a third part of the population is killed, and yet it, re and it still does not, that population does not repent. It says, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. And so God is pouring out his wrath and his judgment upon 
the earth at this point for the wickedness that exists still, that, 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 that must be judged. Now, thankfully, all of us, you know, all Christians, all believers are gone at that time. Now, if we got what we deserved and then we were really judged according to our wickedness, we would probably be enduring the same pain, wouldn't we? And uh, we would ultimately be thrown into the lake of fire for all eternity if we got what we deserve. Thank you, thank you, Lord, for that sacrifice of the Lamb, which keeps coming up in Revelation. Hey, by Him, we've overcome all that. All right, Not because we're so good, and so we don't have to endure these things. It's because we held on to the Lamb. You know, we, 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 got, we got saved, uh, saved by the blood of the Lamb. And so uh, praise the Lord for that. But it's interesting, like, I, I read this sometimes and think, well, why do we even need to know all this stuff if we're not going to be here, you know? And what's ironic about that is growing up, I was taught, like, none of Revelation has to do with us. I mean, you know, after the church is in chapter 2, chapter 3, and, and, and then there's just nothing until the very end. But, uh, but all the, the seals and everything doesn't have to do with us. Well, <clears throat> We do. We are there for the first six chapters. You know, what I mean, I say we. I'm talking about the uh, the saints. We are there for the first six chapters, and then uh, we see what's going to happen after we're gone. And I don't know if we get to like, you know, front row seats to be able to watch these things happen. I mean, the 144,000 apparently do. The two witnesses apparently get to see uh, what's going on. But but we get to read about it no, nonetheless. Right now, we get to read about all the things that God's going to do to cast judgment upon the earth. So anyway, one woe, these weird creatures that come out of the earth. Second woe, this big army and, us, and, and all this uh, population uh, is going to die. But then when we get to chapter 10 and we're waiting for the next woe, it doesn't seem to come. And I'll just tell you a little foreshadowing here. Once we get to that woe, you're thinking, oh, man, I'm, uh, this is going to be good. This is, gonna, this is going to be some huge, significant thing that's going to happen. And then whenever you read it, you're just like, where, where was it? I didn't see it. You know, it, it just it, it doesn't happen. So we'll get to that in a second. OK, so now we get to chapter 10 and we're still in the second woe. But we see a whole lot more that's going to unfold. All right. Not just these locust creatures uh, coming out of the out of the hell out of hell, but we're going to see all these things in chapter 10, verse one. I'm going to just talk about briefly. Uh, I don't know how much time I'll spend on it, but I'm going to talk about the different components uh, or characters that are in these two chapters. OK, so number one, we see this mighty angel. It's not the seventh angel with the trumpet and the, and the, the trumpet judgment, but he's not talking about that angel yet. Okay, well, that's when the woe is going to happen, apparently. But he's not talking about that. He just There's like this little interlude here, and he talks about this mighty angel. Okay, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven. He sees a multitude of angels and, and beings and creatures and all that. And it's like almost like everybody has their little part to play in the end times. You know, every angel, every uh, uh, elder, you know, they've all got their part to play. But he sees uh, another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head and his face was as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire and he had in his hand a little book open and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth and when he cried seven thunders uttered their voices now who is this mighty angel and the truth is i don't know uh, I read a lot of people that say, suggest that this is actually Christ. Now, I, don't, I think it's kind of interesting. Elsewhere, he's called the Lamb, and he's called different things. Why would it all of a sudden call him a, a mighty angel? Seems kind of strange. But some say, yeah, but look at him. He's got the, the rainbow, and he's got the face it is like the sun, and, and all these. Well, actually, a lot of beings, angelic beings that have been seen by the prophets fit a lot fit this profile pretty closely so i'm not going to say for sure that it's the lord in fact in a second i believe that this angel is going to talk to the lord jesus christ and so it doesn't it make sense that he would be talking to himself in that way i could be wrong but we'll look at that but first of all the mighty angel and then it talks about the seven thunders i don't know how exactly it's connected to this angel but oftentimes when these beasts spoke or whatever it was compared to the sound of thunders. All right, so in this case, he's going to hear these voices, 
that sound like thunder, and there's seven voices uh, that he hears speaking. Look at chapter 10, verse 4. When the seven thunders had uttered their voice, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven. That's the next part of this uh, story, this voice from heaven that we're going to see. But anyway, the voice from heaven came, and it said, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. So there you go. There's another mystery. We don't know what is in what was uh, was written or what he was going to write. What those thunders said. It's a mystery. All right. Then uh, those voice the the voice comes. Right. We just read about that in verse four. And the voice out of nowhere seems to say, "Hey, hey, right? Don't don't uh you know seal seal that up." And then all of a sudden, verse eight. Uh, he refers back to that voice, the voice which I heard from heaven spake un unto me again and said, go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, give me the little book. And he said unto me, take it and eat it up and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Now, I know if you read from other prophets, uh, like like Isaiah, for instance, they do similar things. There's this roll of a book. They eat uh, and mouth bitter in the belly. I mean, this is a weird picture of what, what you're seeing here. But the idea is that this prophet has got something that he's going to have to deliver that's kind of bitter. You know, this is the only thing that I can I can get from this. But when he takes it, it's sweet to the mouth. You know, and I've heard the analogy that kind of like that when we read the Bible. We study the Bible. It's sweet to us. We love it. And then whenever we preach it, though, it's not take it's not received very well by other people. You know, they think it's bitter and they think it's a it's a it's a bad thing. And so that is the idea here. But all these little things are kind of uh, mysteries. OK, now look at verse seven. This mighty angel, like I said, he's not the seventh angel. And in this verse, he's actually going to introduce the seven angels. He's going to talk about the seven angels. So verse 7 says, but in the days uh, of the... Let me see here. Get back up in, uh, and uh, read verse. start with verse 5. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him with forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that, are there, that therein are, and the earth and the things which therein are, and the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. Now, who is it that created the world? Who is it that created the heavens and the earth? It was the Word of God, right? And so we know the Bible several times talks about Jesus. You know, all things were created by Him, and they were created for Him. And so, uh, and so here, if this was Jesus, He'd be t swearing by Himself which seems kind of odd, but he says he's, he's swearing that there shall be time no longer. And I think the idea here is that he is just saying, hey, this is it. What's going to happen? This is the finality of all these things. There will be time no longer. There won't be any more time. We know there's time after these events because how long is the millennial reign? The Bible says it's a thousand years. So there's going to still be time. But I think the idea is this is the end of all things. It's, this, it's finally here. And there's not going to be a wait any longer for it to happen. I think that's what he's saying. Okay, but verse 7. Now, this voice is still talking. I mean, uh, this angel is still talking. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants and the prophets. And what I get from this, what I think he's saying is that when this seventh angel sounds, everything is going to be done. Everything is going to be complete. All that's been prophesied to all the prophets, from Genesis to, to you know, uh, up until Revelation here, everything that's been prophesied is going to come to pass. It's going to be finished. All those mysteries are going to be done. And so, uh, of course, that is where I get the title, The Mystery of God uh, Finished. Okay, and then chapter 11. We come here, we see a temple, and he is looking at the temple, but it says uh, the temple of God. Uh, let me see here. He's rise and measure the temple of God. Uh, let me just read this whole thing. Okay, verse 1. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. Now, this would be sort of like uh, what we would use today would be a tape measure. 
And the idea was uh, elsewhere we see somewhere where they use a rod. I think it was Ezekiel used a rod that was three cubits. All right. Remember we recently talked about this. A cubit is like the size of here to here. But everybody's cubit is going to be different. So you needed a standard. And so somebody would measure maybe three cubits or mark it off, you know, or whatever. And then this is now your measuring stick, if you will. You have your, your measuring. So it's not a surprise that he has this rod. That's a natural, a normal way for them to measure things. And he begins to measure the temple. And uh, he, then he says, another mystery to me, <laughs> right? but the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not for it is given unto the Gentiles in the holy city shall they uh, shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And then next on the uh, list of all these different characters are the two witnesses. All right, in verse four he says, the I um, mean verse three says, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And so uh, we'll stop there for a second. And he mentions these two. Now, again, in Zechariah, let's, let's go ahead and find this. This could be dangerous because I don't have this marked. <laughs> Zechariah. I think it was chapter. I think it was chapter two. All right. Okay. Let's look at uh, verse eleven, chapter chapter four. Sorry, chapter four, verse eleven. And I won't, I won't give all the context here. We'll have to go through Zechariah another time. But it says, Then answered I and said unto him, This is another prof, pro, prophet, you know, this is a prophecy, a lot of mis, mysterious stuff here. Said I unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through... Uh, the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves. And he answered me and said, Knowest, not, uh, knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Now, if you read that in the days of Zechariah, you'd be like, what's, what's he talking about? Who are these anointed ones? Right. But then you get to Revelation and he says, my two witnesses, and he says, these are the uh, two witnesses. Uh, it says they are these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before God of the earth. Almost the same language that he used in Zechariah there. So here's what I'm saying. Like all throughout the Bible, you see a very mis a very much a mystery. Now, if you want to make a nice selling book and make a lot of money, you can take one of these Old Testament prophecies and make it say whatever crazy stuff you want it to say, right? <laughs> and people will be intrigued and say, oh, that's really cool. And they can't tell you any differently. So they just go off of that. But the fact is, it's a mystery. None of us really know what it means. And then later on, when it comes to pass, a lot of things in the Bible were prophesied in the Old Testament. New Testament comes along and boom, these things come to pass. And so we say, oh, that makes sense. The Old Testament is now revealed, right? How did they, uh, how'd that old saying go? In the Old Testament is concealed and then the New Testament revealed or something like that. And that's true. And then we get to Revelation and we say, oh, wow, man, all the things Jesus talked about in Matthew 24, they're coming to play. You know, this is what, this is what he was talking about. But the truth is, we're reading this and we're saying, oh, great. He gives us the answer. The two witnesses, right? The two olive trees and the, and the candlesticks. But it's still a mystery. We, we don't, we're not living in that time. We don't understand who that is. And the Bible has a lot to say about, uh, uh, about different mysteries. I'll look at that here in a second. But we don't actually get a clear explanation of this. Here are all these characters. We're talking about the witnesses. It's like, whatever happened to that seventh angel? Where did the seven? What about that third woe? You know, where did it go? Chapter eleven, verse fourteen. The second woe is past, 
And behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Oh, here it is. The woe, where, where is it? You know, what, what's going to happen here? And then you begin reading this, and you're like, where is it? I'm not really seeing where, where the woe is. Let's start with, let's look at verse 18. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, uh, and they should be, uh, that they should be judged, and that they should give reward unto thy, uh, I'm sorry, that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them uh, which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of the testament, and there were lightnings, and voices, and thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail. That's it. That doesn't really say that the seventh angel poured that out, uh, or not poured that out, I'm sorry, blew the trumpet, and, and this was the case. So it's a mystery. We don't completely know. All right, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little bit more insight here in a second. But there's basically three things that I want to take from this idea of the mystery of God, which is going to be finished with that seventh angel. Okay, we, we already know, uh, you know, we've had these six angels so far. We pretty much can follow up what they're going to do, what kind of judgments they're going to bring upon the earth. And then this last one's a mystery. And let me just say about the two witnesses, I think that he's kind of taking a little, uh, uh, you know, it's like all these things are going on while, while everything else is going on. Because the two witnesses are there, it says, for three and a half years, if you do the math there. And so, so obviously he didn't introduce them when they first came on the scene. So because of the events that are going to happen in chapter 11 with the two witnesses, he just kind of like just says, okay, by the way, let me just get you up to speed. There were these two witnesses, and he gives all the details about uh, these witnesses. And some of it you have to kind of put, uh, put two and two together. Now I'm going to preach at some point on the two witnesses specifically, so I'm going to leave that for that. Now I might preach it in Iola, I'm not quite sure, but either way I'll, I'll, I'll get us uh, some more details. I'll, I'll give some more details on that at a later day. But right now, I just want you to see all these characters happen, and we're still wondering what the seventh woe is. And then all of a sudden, we get to chapter 12. In chapter 12, it's like, what happened? I mean, we're, are we reading a different story? <laughs> okay. And my answer there is yes. <laughs> we, we kind of are. All right. Now, I've probably shared this before, and, and many of you guys probably already know this. We've talked about it or whatever. Uh, and I preached in Iola a while back where I briefly explained this idea, and I didn't know what to call it exactly, so I tried to make up a word. I'm good at that. I made up a word this morning, and uh, what was the word? It was called, uh, let me see here, the personalness. Did you know that's a word? That's a word. <laughs> personalness. <laughs> anyway, but I made up this other word. It, it doesn't exist. <laughs> I, I, I made this word up. This was the title of the message, the Deutero-Apocalypse. The Deutero-Apocalypse. Okay, so the idea is this. You're familiar with the word Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy means like a second telling of the law. So after you read Exodus, you know, Leviticus, Numbers, then you get to Deuteronomy and you're like, hey, I, didn't I just read this? It's telling the same story over again. It's a second view. And, and it's really cool. I, I really believe God did this so that when you read it a second time through, it gives more light on the first. I mean, you couldn't, it wouldn't make as much sense if you read it with all the detail given at once. But you read it from one perspective, and it's like you're getting a 360 view. You know what I mean? Now you're reading it from a slightly different angle, and it really helps. The Gospels, I mean, I could go on on 1 Kings, 2 Kings, and then you compare that to, uh, or even, I guess, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, compare that to uh, uh, Chronicles, you know what I mean? And, uh, and, and many places in the Bible where you, you hear it, and then you kinda, it's given again a second time. Ezekiel, you get the image of the, uh, uh, of the, the cherubims right? And then in chapter 1 and then in chapter 10, he gives that vision again, but it's slightly different, you know what I mean? Because he's seeing it from a different angle or whatever. And over and over the Bible does this. And so in the book of Revelation, okay, or the apocalypse, if you will, in the book of Revelation, when he gets this vision, it's really cool. But what I believe happens here is that half of the book of Revelation is one telling of all the events that are going to take place. We've gotten all the way up to the seventh angel. We just don't completely know what that seventh angel did and what that woe was. It doesn't completely seem to fit into our thinking as to what the woe would be. But now, after chapter 12, 
he's going to tell all this over again. So the rest of the book of Revelation, up until chapter 21, or uh, up until chapter 20, which will start talking about the millennial kingdom and everything, is going to tell all these events again. So it goes back all the way to, it's going to start talking about the time of Christ, and then it's going to start talking about the persecution of the church, and it's like, it really just summarizes real quickly all the way up to the coming of the Antichrist. Then we get more details about that. So in the end of chapter 11, it even talks about this beast. And it's like the beast that rose up out of, out of uh, hell. And you're like, what beast? I don't remember seeing this. Where did this beast come from? Well, in chapter 12 and chapter 13, it's going to give you a lot more details about this beast. Now, some people read that and they want really badly to make everything that happens after chapter 12 a continuation of chapter 11. To the point where some say, well, you know what the third woe is? The third woe is everything that happens from chapter 12, you know, and on. And so all those, when you see those uh, vile judgments, they say, okay, well, now these vile judgments is a new set of judgments upon the, upon the earth. It just doesn't make sense to me, all right, because everything is destroyed. <laughs> I mean, everybody's dead. And then all of a sudden, okay, now we're going to go through this all over again and pour out these other seals. No, there's definitely a distinction here, and, and, and I would even go farther than some people maybe and say there is such a close um, similarity in the trumpet judgments and the vile judgments that I'm not going to say they're the exact same thing, but kind of like I was saying, it's kind of like a different angle of the same thing, like a different view of the judgments that are being poured out upon the earth. So when you read this second, uh, sec the second telling of the Revelation from chapter 12 on, you can see some details that you didn't see in chapter uh, 5 through 11. Okay, and so it's really cool how God does it all throughout, the, uh, throughout His Word because it gives you uh, kind of like it defines a lot of things for one, th for one thing, and then it just kind of gives you a better understanding, a better perspective. You know, it's kind of like looking at it from different angles. Uh, some of you guys know I've been drawing a lot of animals for... Uh, uh, this coloring book I'm hoping to do. Long story, okay? I'll give you more details about it later. <laughs> but I, recently I was going to draw a shark. And so I looked up a reference and I looked up a shark. And this image came up that was three-dimensional. And you could just take your cursor and you could move that thing. And you could see the underneath of it. You could see the side of it. And I was like, well, that's really cool. Because sometimes if you're looking at a reference and it's a little angle, you're like, oh, man, I wish I knew what was on the other side of that, right? Well, God gives us the, His Word in like a three-dimensional view, you can see all these different angles of it if you just read the Bible and you trust that He's given you everything. And so the world doesn't understand that. And they say, oh, there's all these contradictions. No, there's not contradictions. It's just you're seeing it from different angles. And when those two come together, you get a full picture of what's happening. Kind of like this morning uh, in Iola, I mentioned uh, uh, this morning, we're talking about bearing your cross. All right, everybody has a cross that they have to bear. And, uh, and I was talking about how uh, the Bible talks about Jesus bearing his cross, right? In John, it says he bore his cross to Golgotha. And then in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you know, you're reading those, and it's saying there's a man named Simon of Serene, the Serenian, whatever, who was t commanded to bear the cross for Jesus, right? And you look at Luke and it says, well, he bore the cross uh, after, after Jesus. Okay? So some people say, well, there's a discrepancy. He, he, he bore the cross. And then, uh, uh, and then other people say that, you know, in John, it says that Jesus bore the cross. And so there's a discrepancy. It's got to be wrong. And others say, no, it has to be, uh, that can't be true. And so they point to Luke right there where it says he carried after Jesus. And so how many times, we've all heard this, that Jesus was carrying the cross and he fell beneath the, the weight of the cross. Okay, there's songs about that and any, any depiction you've ever watched, any movies or something like that, uh, you always see that he's carrying the cross. And because he's been beaten and, 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 and had such a hard time, he's weak and he can't take it. And so he's fallen and he can't carry the cross. And so, hey, you. Simon, carry this for him. And so then they say he carried it after Jesus. So like Jesus carried it first, couldn't handle it, and then Simon did. Well, really, there's a more beautiful story to that. And, and uh, if I have never shared it before, I probably will sometime. But if you look at the story of Isaac when Abraham was getting ready to sacrifice him, you know, he was obeying the, the command of the Lord 
And obviously he didn't, he didn't have to go through with it. But, but in that process, it says that they loaded up the, the beast. Okay, I don't think it calls it a donkey. I think it just says a beast. Beast of burden, okay? And he loads up the wood on the beast. And then they go to the mountain. And when they get to the mountain, they take the wood off of the beast, put it on the back of Isaac, and then he goes up to the place where he's going to be sacrificed. And really, if you, if you read between the lines, this is what's going on. And when they say that Simon carried the cross after Jesus, it literally means Jesus was leading the way. They were leading Jesus out in front. You can read that in all the different accounts. And then Simon was carrying the cross behind him in kind of like the procession. And once they got to Golgotha, they put the cross upon Jesus and he carried it up to the place where he was crucified, which is a beautiful picture just like uh, uh, that matches up. And the wording is almost identical to the story of Abraham and Isaac. And so when you read that and you begin to see that like three dimensional view, like if we didn't have John, we wouldn't know. We wouldn't know that. You know, if we didn't have Luke, we wouldn't understand that. And not to mention if we didn't have the pictures of Isaac, you know, that God gave us in Genesis, we wouldn't understand that. It's a beautiful thing to be able to see. Uh, clearly from the Bible whenever it does that. Okay, so so number one, the point that I want to get from this idea of the mystery of God finished. Number one, I believe that phrase right there in chapter 11, 10, is actually more evidence about what I'm talking about, this second telling of, of Revelation, if you will, because he's saying that all things are coming to an end. And when that seventh angel comes, right, it's, everything is going to be finished. The mystery of God is finished. The time will be no more and all this, okay? And then you read the end of chapter 11, and, uh, and you're seeing that, hey, it's like, it's like this is the end. And then it, and then it, and it says, uh, uh, okay, where's the part where it says the kingdoms, uh, the kingdoms of the earth that become our Lord's? Uh, let me see here. Okay, verse uh, 15, chapter 11, verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Doesn't that kind of sound like the end of the story? Right. So it seems weird that chapter 12 and beyond is going to be some new set of story, thing, events that are added upon, added unto this. No, this is the end of the story, okay? And I think this is further evidence about that, that, that he's saying right here that the mystery of God is going to be finished. Okay, look at chapter 16 now. And we'll get, this, we'll get to this in time, but when you see this second telling, now you're going to see angels pouring out these vile judgments and they match up those trumpet judgments very closely. Okay, and so whenever you get to chapter 16, verse 17, you're now going to see more details about this seventh angel, uh, the, the judgments that's poured out, or the third woe, if you would, okay? And I want you, uh, we'll go back and read 11 here in a minute, but let's read this 16, chapter 16, verse 17. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. Wait a minute, I thought it already was done back in chapter 11. Well, it was. Now we're telling the story again, okay? And, uh, and there were uh, voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. See, we read about that in chapter 11, verse 19. It says, And the temple of God was open in heaven, and there was seen in the temple the ark of his testament, and there was lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquakes and great hail. But it didn't really elaborate on that that much. Here in chapter 16, it's elaborating a little bit on that, and it's, and it's saying... Uh, you know, men, uh, uh, it was not, it was uh, such as not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of, and the na of the nations fell and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. 
and every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and there fell upon men a great hail. Now, chapter 11 ended with, and great hail. Okay, It says, it gave a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. Now, I don't know how much that is because I don't think it's like... Uh, I don't think it's like the old saying, you know, which weighs more, a pound of bricks or a pound of feathers. You ever heard that? I wonder, I wonder how many of you guys get it. <laughs> a lot of people don't get that. You're like, oh, a pound of bricks obviously weighs more than a pound of feathers. No, it's a pound, whether it's a pound of feathers or a pound of bricks. Okay, I don't think it's like that. I think a talent is different because I read somewhere, I don't know if I believe them or not, because I, I just, you just don't know. But <laughs> I read that a talent of silver was like 100 pounds. And a talent of gold was like 200 pounds. So I don't know what this is a talent of, a, a talent of rock, I guess. I don't know, a talent of, of hail, okay? But, uh, but we're talking about a great weight, okay, uh, that would just crush a person coming down from, from, from the sky. So the weight of a talent, and then it says, And men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. So now you see where it sounds a little bit more like the third woe. All right, it didn't use that word in the in in chapter eleven, but we know that the woe was coming, and we know that it had to have been it. Okay, so number one is just the, that simple point. That's what we can get from this mystery of God finished. Is more evidence about the uh, second telling of the end times from chapter twelve and, and uh, beyond. But number two. We can get we can learn this lesson here that although many mysteries are revealed in the Bible, some will remain a mystery until that day when all things come to pass. Okay, and we don't understand. We can read about it and we know it's coming. We believe that we trust the Lord, but some things are still a mystery. Uh, in our lesson in Sunday school, when we talked about the uh, uh, the different mysteries and. And let me just mention a few of them. I won't, we won't look at all of the, the verses, but the Bible talks about the mystery of godliness, right? The mystery of godliness. And, uh, and it talks about in, in reference to, you know, the deity of Christ and how Christ came into the flesh and how he died and he was raised up again. And, 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 and when you think about that, there's a lot of mysteries there. How did the word become flesh? We don't understand. You know, we, we talk about, hey, this is the Word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. Therefore, this is Jesus. <laughs> That's not exactly how it works, but you understand that there's some mysteries involved in that, that He's the Word of God. And when we read the Bible, we're reading the Word of God. You know what I mean? It's, it's a mystery. How did He become flesh? How did God, a spirit, was He born of a virgin? Did He, be, did he, did he get human flesh? You know, and then how did that flesh die and he was raised up with a glorified body? It's, it's a great mystery. The mystery of the Trinity, right? That's another way to look at the mystery of godliness. Anybody, is there anybody that can explain the Trinity perfectly? No, you can't. If you think you can, <laughs> you know you're wrong because it's something that's so beyond our mind, we can't comprehend it entirely. We can try to explain it, but here's what we know. One God three persons. 1 John 5, 7 makes it very clear. These three are one. Okay. You say, well, that doesn't make sense, but it's in the Bible and I believe it. <laughs> okay. And so, uh, but it's still a mystery. One day, hopefully God will allow us to understand it a little bit better, maybe. Uh, but there's a mystery of godliness. The Bible over and over, probably the most times the word mystery is used has to do with the gospel, the mystery of the gospel. Now to the world, it's foolishness. To the world, they don't understand it. To the world, the gospel, like, what? That doesn't even make sense. When we're saved, we, we get it. Somehow we get it, but it's still even a little bit of a mystery, you know, that God would just decide that my, I'm, I'm going to have my son be the sacrifice, pay for all the sins of the world, and all you have to do is trust in my son, and I'm going to give you eternal life. That's a mystery. I don't understand that, but I believe it, and you better believe it. <laughs> or else you can't be saved, right? That's the mystery of the gospel. Paul says, pray for me that I might uh, be able to make known the mysteries of the gospel. And that's, that's our job, by the way, right? It's not that it's a mystery in that people can't understand it. It's that it's a mystery that we understand it. It's concealed to them. They don't understand it, but our job is to make known the mystery of the gospel. And so that's our, that's, that's our ministry. But the gospel is a ministry. The Bible talks about the ministry of faith equally uh, 
uh, related there to the ministry of the gospel, mystery of the gospel, the mystery of the blindness of Israel. Okay, all throughout the Old Testament, there was actually uh, little uh, uh, little pictures or or foreshadowings that one day the gospel would go to the whole world and all Gentiles would be able to get saved and, and they would be able to uh, know Jesus and, and the light would, would shine to the Gentiles. But look, the Jews didn't know that. They didn't understand that. They thought it was them alone. And to this day, Jews think, hey, one day, you know, we're going to have, we're going to be back in the land and, and we're going to rule and reign the world. And, and all the Goyims, are going to be uh, serving us. The, that's Gentiles. They're, they're going to be serving us. And they still believe that to this day. And they've always believed that because they didn't understand that when Christ came, you know, he was coming for the whole world. Amen. And of course, they rejected him. And, uh, and there's a mystery Paul talks about in Romans 8. He talks about the mystery uh, that blindness in part has come to Israel. Okay. And, uh, and I'm telling you, it's a mystery. A lot of people got all kind of weird views on, <laughs> on what that means. And, the, and, and what's going to happen in the end times and all that. But it is a mystery, a bit of a mystery. There's a mystery if you read uh, 2 Thessalonians and uh, 1 Corinthians 15. There's a mystery about the, uh, the iniquity of man and the rising of the Antichrist and the, uh, and the resurrection of the saints. I mean, all these things are, are referred to in the Bible as mysteries. And then uh, Ephesians 5.32 talks about the mystery of the bride of Christ. He's talking about husbands loving your wives. And then he says, hey, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Okay, so the Bible is just filled with mysteries. Now, sometimes, like I said, the mysteries are revealed and explained. You know, it's kind of like when the disciples ask Jesus, like, why are you speaking in these parables? We don't understand these parables. And he's saying, I'm, spe I'm speaking in parables because it's for you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. Right. But it's not for them to know. The disciples are kind of like, well, we would like to know. <laughs> so explain it to us. Because even whenever he explained it to them, it was still a bit of a mystery. It's not that they weren't saved, that they didn't get it. And that's just why, like, it's not like once you're saved. Now, let, let me, when you have the Holy Spirit within you, you're going to understand the Bible a whole lot better than before you were saved. There's no doubt about that. But nobody's just going to pick up the Bible after they get saved and just read it and just everything just makes 100% you know, sense in their mind. It's going to take time. There's still a lot of mysteries. There's still a lot of unknowns. But there's going to come a time when all that is fulfilled and all of it comes to pass just like God said it would and it'll make sense to us like never before. In, this chap in uh, chapter 11, one of the marvels probably throughout the centuries was how these two witnesses are going to be seen by the whole world because that's what he talks about they're going to be they're, they're finally going to overcome these i mean god allows it to happen overcome these two witnesses and these two witnesses are going to lie dead in the streets and it says the whole world is going to watch them and they're going to be rejoicing and they're going to be giving each other's presence and they're going to be now for many many years many centuries I'm sure people read that and said, well, how's the whole world going to see that? You know, then somebody comes up with television and it becomes a household item. Everyone has television. They said, whoa, maybe everybody's going to see it through television. Then they came up with Internet. Hey, everybody's got Wi-Fi. Dial up. That's by, that's by day back in the 90s. <laughs> really slow access. But people still thought, oh, wow, the Internet. Everybody's going to see it now. In third world countries, in huts in Africa, they've got smartphones and they can look stuff up and they can watch things. And there are literally people who who will keep observing. I remember whenever they uh, there was a giraffe that ha was having a, in the zoo. It was having a baby. Do you remember that? Everybody was watching this. Well, not everybody, but okay, I did once or twice. But <laughs> and it's like live stream. You could watch this giraffe and. Everyone's waiting for this draft to have a baby. So for like a week or something like that, people are tuning in and they're just coming back. Did they have it yet? Did they have it yet? And they're watching this camera that's just uh, uh, focusing on this, this uh, giraffe waiting for it to have its baby. Finally, it had a baby on live TV and all the whole world was watching. I mean, not every individual, but the whole world had access to it for all over the world and could see this, this being born. One day, these two witnesses are going to lie in the street and they're going to say, ah, these are the guys that have been causing all these plagues and bringing all these judgments upon us. And look, 
We overcame them. They're dead in the streets, mocking them, making fun of them. They're all happy, and uh, and they're, you know, uh, uh, observing observing them online, no doubt. Now we understand that, but we didn't. Nobody would have understood that before modern technology, you know. We understand a little bit clearer now about the mark of the beast and not being able to buy, sell, trade unless you receive the mark. We still don't completely understand that, but we. It's like we understand a little bit better, maybe, with the technology the way it is today. <laughs> but one day, all these things will be revealed completely. We'll know it, because they're going to happen. Which brings me to my third point, and that is this. I'm not going to spend any time on this at all, but God already knows how it's all going to end. And if you think about it, it's like all these things. I mean, I, I love reading the book of Revelation, because you constantly have to remind yourself, like, it's not like we're reading about events that happened. Like, these are events that haven't even happened yet. And there's parts of Revelation, what I love is the thought that there are parts of Revelation where we're probably present <laughs> in heaven, you know what I mean? And we're reading about this, and we're actually already there if, if you know, if we were able, reading it in real time. But the fact of the matter is, it's like everything is already done. God has got it all planned out. Now, I'm not talking about a, like He predestined everything to be exactly the way it is, No. Uh, he gave us free will, our, our choices, you know, uh, have determined the course of events to some extent over the years, but he has a foreknowledge of how things are going to happen. And he does, he can intervene and allow things to move according to his will. And in the very end, he, he's already told us in the Bible what's going to happen. And we can rest assured that it's going to happen. All right, so you can have lots of questions about revelation, about prophecy all throughout the Bible, uh, about how does this work, how does that work, you know, who are the two witnesses. I mean, you could go on and on speculating and having uh, all the, trying to figure out all these mysteries. Maybe you'll get some right, maybe you'll get some wrong, but the bottom line is that one day the mysteries of God, the mystery of God will be finished. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you. For your word, thank you for the book of Revelation. Wonderful uh, ending, of course, to, to your, your word as you've given to us. And I pray, Lord, that you'll allow us to just uh, live according to faith. And even in the things that we don't understand, I pray that you'll help us to, uh, uh, to just uh, uh, believe by faith and, and, and live according to what your word tells us to. Trusting, Lord, that you're going to recompense us in the uh, resurrection of the just. And I pray, Lord, that you will uh, uh, bless this church and the efforts uh, that are given towards reaching the world with your gospel. We want uh, the world to see our works, that you may be glorified, Lord, not uh, for our own glory. I pray that you help us remember that and keep, uh, keep that in our hearts, that, Lord, that we would please you and glorify you, be a light to the world, uh, that we would shine uh, the glorious gospel upon the world, I pray. Lord, be glorified now in Jesus' name. Amen.